right. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to awkwardly stand in the very center <laughs> temporarily. <laughs> um, my name is Rowan Newfeld. I'm the events coordinator for McNally Robinson uh, in Saskatoon. Um, tonight's event is coming to you live from Treaty 6 territory, uh, the traditional lands of the Cree, of the Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Um, special hello to anyone who is watching us on the live stream. Thanks for joining us virtually. Um, and obviously to everyone who's here in person, uh, it's great to see people in the space. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Cities Move Away by Joanne Liao. Um, so huge thanks to Jan uh, Joanne for being here tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank Turnstone Press and especially Sharon Caseberg for working with us on tonight's event. And we also have a very special guest host here with us, Tineo K. Campbell. Yeah, let's give them both a big round of applause. Um, so I'm gonna introduce, I'm gonna introduce Tineo first. And, um, introduce Joanne. Uh, Joanne's going to read uh, for you and then Joanne and Tenille are going to chat for a bit. We'll have some time for questions um, and a book signing. So uh, Tenille K. Campbell is an award-winning Dene Métis author and photographer from English River First Nation in Saskatchewan. Her debut, collect, or debut poetry collection, Indian Love Poems, was shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award for Most Significant Work of Poetry in English by an, an emerging Indigenous writer, and the Mary Sporer Award for Best Book by a Manitoba publisher. Uh, it also won both the Rasmussen, Rasmussen and Shirowski Indigenous Peoples Award for uh, Writing Award, and the O'Reilly Insurance and the Cooperators First Book Award. Uh, her most recent collection is Maybe Mizu, Good Medicine, and that was published by our Snowball Press. So let's give to you another round of applause. And of course, uh, Joanne Liao, who we're here to celebrate tonight, uh, launching her debut poetry collection. Uh, Joanne is an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Her essays, fiction, and poetry have been published in Brick, Catapult, and uh, the Evergreen Review, The Goose, Io, and many more. She grew up in Singapore and currently lives on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon. And Seas Move Away is her first book. So, Joanne? Take it away. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think this is on now. I feel like I should take out the guitar and start strumming. <laughs> this is what it feels like. Thanks so much to everyone for coming. I really, really appreciate it. I didn't expect such a crowd. Special shout out to my neighbors from Kirk Crescent who are right there. Thank you, Peter G. Um, I'd like to thank a couple of people before I start. Obviously, my publishers, uh, Turnstone Press. Thanks so much to Sharon, uh, Jameis, and Melissa for taking a chance on a 42-year-old's first poetry collection. So I feel like a late bloomer. Um, also, thanks to my editor, Peter Bigley, um, and also Joanne Arnott, Lydia Kwa, Adrian Leon, and Phoebe Wang, all of whom read early editions and versions of this work. So I know you are out there somewhere watching on YouTube. Hi. Um, of course, thank you to Mingali Robinson, um, Melissa and Rowan, who've done a fantastic job putting this all together. And I'm so honored to be here to you because there's just so much that we share and I'm really excited and I feel like you know you you really see me so I'm really really glad to be in conversation with you um, and, um, of course my friends my family my colleagues the Department of English uh, the University of Saskatchewan I just want to shout out a couple um, give a shout out to a couple of people who really played a great role um, in helping me really conceive of this book and put it together so Fenuel Antwi Maria Campbell, Rose Roberts, um, uh, the late C.D. Wright, who was my first poetry mentor in Brown University 20 years ago. So this is how long this collection has been in the making. And Elizabeth Phillips, who was the uh, writer in residence in the, in the Saskatoon Public Library, who went over some of these poems with great detail. I have to thank as well uh, funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council um, for funding part of the travel research um, that helped me put this collection together. Um, I'd like to thank my students, some of whom who are here. Um, you know, they tackle the hardest questions in the classroom with me and help me see clearly, more clearly, um, all the things that are going on in this world. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And finally, this book is dedicated to my late mother and my grandmother, whom I lost um, this past year. Um, they moved as well. 
Um, but also this book is dedicated to my dad um, who, and my other friends in Singapore, who I know hopefully are somewhere in the live stream. Um, and then as well to exiles, transnational kin, migrants everywhere. So I am going to um, start reading uh, from the first poem in the book, just to give you a kind of way in, into this collection. Um, Please move away. The quote comes from The English Patient by Michael Andaje. Um, and the full quote goes, seas move away, why not lovers? Right, the harvest of Ephesius, the river of um, Heraclitus disappear and are replaced by estuaries of silt. And I was thinking about this quotation as I was coming up with this, um, with this collection because it's true, you know, things that you think are completely permanent, like seas. And we're seeing that in particular now, rivers, seas, moving away, changing. And I was thinking about that in context of human relationships as well and things that, and people that you think are going to be in your lives forever. And what does that mean um, when that is taken away from you as well? So I guess, you know, a lot of the collection, aside from thinking about um, ecology and the environment, also thinks about diasporic perspectives and those that, that really difficult to define intersection between our public lives and politics, and then the intimacy of and the poetic to the intimate, you know, and how we sort of are with each other, how we're living together. So the first poem I'm going to read to you is called National Day, and it's about National Day in Singapore, which is, I suppose, our Independence Day. And it's always a day that is incredibly fraught and has this huge military parade. And it's very, very choreographed. They rehearse for six months in advance. Everything is just planned to a T. So this is National Day for Philip. To you who know no other sea, and you who left decades before me, to you, returned, rejected, condemned, censored, trapped. To you, non-citizens in and out of borders. To you, you with bittersweet relationships with the land, always trying to explain why, even as I never ask. Because I was different. Because I couldn't breathe. Because I saw something. Because I saw nothing. To you, everywhere. So I'm opening the book with this, I suppose, the kind of like calling out or dedication um, to exiles from Singapore, to diasporic people, but also exiles everywhere, with this kind of complicated relationship to their homeland. And I don't think that's like just unique to Singapore. I think lots of people have very complicated relationships to their homeland. So I'm hoping to sort of think through when we think about the national, right, and your maybe patriotism, like who gets lost? Who gets, who falls into the cracks, right? Who, who doesn't feel patriotic for whatever very, very complicated reason? Um, and that's you know, who that poem is dedicated to. So um, move, like, I'm just gonna read you a couple of poems from this section. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you have been to Singapore, aside from my husband and maybe some of my friends here, but it's a really complicated, very highly planned city. And I, I suppose I have a very, very difficult relationship with it. Um, it's not all crazy with Asians, just, <laughs> so in Singapore, because it's very highly planned, there's the city gallery, they call it city gallery. And in the city gallery, there is a to scale model of the entire island, every single building, every single road. And it's just like incredible detail, right? Um, and so I was thinking of this model when I wrote this poem, City Gallery in Singapore. This island has its own intimate weight, this road running down the center is its central artery, its tree-lined spine. I want to know its watery heart, all its old depositories, its forgotten views. Let me be miniaturized and frozen in this model made to scale with its tiny sign indicating you are here. I will trace the fickle arc of progress, the pain and pleasure of its geographies, symmetrical, architectural, guttural, Breathe in the dust and constant constructions, the upturned red earth. Touch the calloused hands carrying concrete, bricks, rebar. Listen to the pile driving, filling my head and chest, my bones disinterred by the demolitions. Yes, this is not going to be cheerful for Jimmy, just so you know. <laughs> so, another poem that I've been writing, thinking about. Um, Singapore, and I don't know how much uh, of the politics you know, 
the same political party has been in power uh, for approximately well all of Singaporean contemporary history, and so it is authoritarian, even though it, you know it's it's I guess nominally a democracy, and so there's a lot of control uh, over people's lives, but also over uh, the territory itself. And this next poem that I'm going to read, um, called Foreshore's Act, is about the act of what Singaporean government calls reclaiming land. So it's not exactly reclaiming land, but land back in our context. Um, but it's really taking sand from somewhere else, usually Vietnam or Indonesia or Malaysia, and then expanding the territory of Singapore. And this was a practice that started in colonial times. And to me, I always think of it as kind of occupation by other means. You're really destroying someone else's ecological system by taking sand out of their rivers and then creating all this new land. And then what they built was a casino and hotel. And so it's, I mean, it's spectacular, don't get me wrong. And if you've seen Crazy Rich Asians, you know what I'm talking about, that Skyline is really spectacular. But I'm thinking about, you know, what is invisible, I guess. What is, what, what you can't see underneath this really beautiful city that's made for photographs, right? So I'm thinking about what is unphotographable. So um, in this section of um, poems, I'm looking at particular laws in Singapore and looking at the legal language, right? So Four Shores Act, Singapore. The Four Shores Act, Chapter 113, Original Enactment, Consolidated Ordinance 8 of 1872, Ordinance 1 of 1901, and Ordinance 10 of 1912, Revised Edition 1985. Words to make land by. Reclamations, validations, facilitations, foreshores, and all submerged lands. Granularity of sand includes messages, tenements, reditaments, any space you might want to live in of any tenure. Ports, keys, wharves, jetties, flotsam, and other jetsam we choose to jettison into the sea. No person shall be entitled, no action or proceeding against, no compensation for these interests. My feet that touch the seabed that swim in this tidal river, that channel my body, those minerals my blood, coral, stone, clay, sand, gravel, brine, petroleum, mineral oil, words to include every consequence. Nothing in this act is dangerous, is derogation of our power, our rights, our territory. So that is a kind of more formal uh, section thinking of you know, sort of idea of power in the state. The sections in Singapore also have more intimate personal poems. Some of them who are about my mom, whom I just lost in May, so I find them really hard to read. <laughs> but I really wanted to read this one about my grandmother um, who passed away. Uh, she was born in 1922. And so she passed away in 1999. And she was, she was a tough lady, tough lady. Um, and th so this poem, Grandmother in Inventory, is written in her voice, um, in some ways just translated from the Chinese dialect that she spoke to me. Grandmother and inventory. I'm already a dead person. Burn it all, the jewels, the lesser diamonds. Do you want this bolt of cloth? I've given away so much, almost all of it. What can I take with me? Did I tell you I wanted to be buried in this? I don't remember that conversation. Someone has been through my things. They've taken something. That bracelet, my wedding rings, the purse of money, this pendant, take it. I've had it since I was a little girl. You can't buy jade like this anymore. Please take the sewing machine. Do you want it? Here's the cover I made. I'd like you to bathe me or ask the lady who came the other day. Isn't she coming back? I don't know her name. When it is brighter, after we have breakfast, I'd like you to open the safe again. It's been so long. Take out every box, lay it all on the bed, unzip every pouch, open every container. In the light, we'll be able to see. That was harder to read than I thought it would be. So the next couple of poems that I'm going to read for you, um, if I have some time, um, are set in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Um, the first one that I'm going to read is called How Not to Settle. And it is about 63 Kirk Crescent for the people living in Kirk Crescent. <laughs> How Not to Settle. This house, 
for which you will pay your weight in time and words. Who did it belong to before? The carefully tended lawn, its grass, artificial and verdant fervor, inside are the original moldings, asymmetries, nail holes. Here are the scars in the concrete that were filled with more cement to save the foundation from the secret expansion of the clay soil. Who told you that you might come here, live here, work here, write here? Who said that the words that emerge from your pen, your mouth, might be the keys to this backyard with its trees older than your firstborn, this driveway for too many cars, this addition? Was this burial ground, farm, field, meeting place? How does thin air translate itself to paint, water, and siding? Just gonna read a couple more. Um, this one is about my work as a university professor. So hello all the professors in the room. <laughs> it's called rubric. I'm sorry, I don't mean to remind you of grading, but I have to. And all my students, I, I don't mean you. I'm not like stressed about you. <laughs> rubric. My futile work is to stem this broken down course of the imperial language its rules thrown to the wind, shattered by so many other tongues, tracing the journeys made by bureaucrats, governors, planners, destroyers, colonialists, explorers, missionaries, ignorance. All the words spoken by those in three-piece suits ill-suited for the climate, high-necked, grubby, white cassocks and habits, making inroads, not just in the interiors of continents, in smallish or vast archipelagos, but also in the folds, synapses, and cords, throats constricted, tongues tamed, palate, teeth subjected, objected, rejected. How much has been lost? Love songs, dissent, passion, metaphors, and all manner of stories and other ways of making sounds to express beauty, dying, hunger. Spell it this way. Conjugate, synthesize, syntax, agitate, place the punctuation, grammatically integrate your protest here. Write of grief, memory with the most elegant and violent of phrasings. Don't repeat that clause. Look out for patterns. Can you see the traces of others in your writing, in their writing, in my writing, in my voice, my mouth, that will never be yours? I can tell you to break it, make it new. But these rules adhere to us like weights, like bells, like stones. Who made them? On whose backs? Whose authority? Son of, daughter of, child of, which rebellion, revolution, invasion, occupation, genocide. Each word insufficient to account for it all. Okay, so I see that we have some time. You think I can do one or two more? What do you think? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to read one called Western Interior Seaway, uh, which was inspired by, by a conversation I had with Joanne Arnott. So thank you, Joanne. Um, she said, if I'm going to write about seas in Singapore, I have to think about how seas are related to Saskatchewan, which is very hard. It's very hard. You have to go back in geological time and think about how millions of years ago we would were, we were be in a Western tropical sea, like Western Interior Seaway in a tropical sea. So this is what this poem is about. From the air, I can almost see it, believe that the lights of the houses are those of ships set against dark waters. I recall other night land days, my home island surrounded by oil tankers glutted with barrels of crude. Here though, traces are deeply buried, veins of potash and oil, thick pink salts, black slurry, the substances of death and life shaping the politics of this bone dry land, deep in the lungs of those insisting all pleasures and rights are linked to mining out all that remains. All this used to be tropical, lush, green, humid, warm, a shallow, wide, salty body of water now buried beneath the centuries of suburban and rural life. Ruination, occupation, dams, railways, asphalt, pipes, gas lands, guys, gas lines, sewage, Memory must descend. Let me read a last one. Um, there is a, I don't know what you think, two more, one more? Try the old lover. Let's see which one. Come on, you pick two. <laughs> okay, you're right. All right, okay. So, you know what? I'm just going to do market vision. All right, I, yeah, she said it was her favorite, so I can't not read it. 
Um, you have the collections on page 55. <laughs> <laughs> this poem is for my sons, who are not here because they had a freshy football game. <laughs> God, it's old now. <laughs> no, no. It would be very awkward to read when they're here, so I'm kind of grateful they're not. Um, Market of Asia on 8th Street. One day when I'm old, you will take me here in the cold. I will thread my arms through yours. My sons, I will be so much smaller then, but still I will search the aisle for a jar, a bottle, a plastic packet containing a memory that refuses to leave, something that a parent or grandparent once tended to on a stone. I will grasp for the tenuous, the half-remembered, the snatches, my nose to a prickly fruit, tongue to a sample spoon. The seasons and festivals will go on without me, older than I ever will be and more distant. I have only what I learned in books, secondhand, cut by repeated diasporas. I will have taught you the last of the forgotten tones of my mother's Penang tongue, my father's Teochew accent subsumed in it, the Hakka woman who cared for a tiny version of me always hovering on my lips. We will reminisce about childhood trips back to the heat of the past, the aunties and uncles, unrelated by blood, who were kind to us, who cooked all that was good, who called you, handsome, foreign, other, we will never be able to return. Stop there. All that academic school manager had to turn on. <laughs> 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 Sorry, to make to make you cheer up again. I know I was just like blinking really fast. Um, first of all, thank you for that reading. It was beautiful. Thank you. Um, it has been nothing but a pleasure and a gift on my end. Um, just kind of immersing myself in your worldview, and although like we have been friends. Um, there's just something so intimate about reading your truth and poetry. And thank you, thank you for this gift. But the questions. <laughs> the questions. Um, I, I don't want to talk about your mother and your grandmother because they'll make me cry. But <laughs> I feel like we have to. This is a beautiful honoring of them and of this past and of Singapore. And, um, Oh, I'm sorry guys, it's so fresh for both of us. <laughs> but you talk about generations past and generations to come. Um, what are some of the things that you hope will echo down when we talk about generations past that your children will remember that? Because in this last poem, we talk about accents being lost. We talk about food, we talk about kinship, we talk about the roles we'll play that our mothers played, that our grandmothers played. You know, in our in our dreams, what does this look like down the road for your boys and their children if they have children? I am so bad they're not me. Um, <laughs> I know, but we have to. <laughs> she didn't have me the tissue box. She had you. I think when I was writing the poems, I think when I was writing the poems, I was thinking really about the body, and what the body holds, and what the body remembers, even when, you know, in some conscious way, you can't speak the language anymore, you can't cook the recipes your grandmother made, you don't remember when that festival was and what to do. But I think there's something in your body that, you know, when I taste something, for instance, some of my boys taste something, um, that they smell something when we go back, like it takes them, like something deeper in a kind of corporeal sense. And so I hope they never lose track of that. And so I feel like if they have that, when they're older, they can always go back and learn a language or go as, as, as I did when I moved away to study when I was like 19, like consult a cookbook and find that memory there, even if somehow it didn't, it wasn't transmitted to me by someone in my family because of, for whatever reason, right? My grandmother was always chasing me out the kitchen because she was like, go study. 
go study, go read your books. Don't, don't come in the kitchen, you're chopping the onions wrong. <laughs> um, and my mom didn't cook very much because of that. So I feel like because of colonialism, because of the kind of emphasis in Singapore, I guess, on education, a lot of a lot of the stuff is lost for my for my family at any case, because they're always just like, just do well in school and get ahead, you know, don't be stuck in the kitchen like me. And instead, actually, sometimes when I like this, so I can't I can't make this, so I gotta go learn it from scratch. So I, I hope my boys will always retain that kind of physical sensorial memory of it. So when they even if they can't make it, they don't want to taste right or taste wrong. Does that make sense? No, I get it. Um, as I read through this book, I was struck by the many similarities that, as an Indigenous person in Canada, that we have gone through. We talk about the loss of language. We talk about the loss of land. As you said, not the reclamation land, but blank land back and how it's used in different ways. Mm. Uh, and in your poem, your poetry, you're talking about this constant othering, both in your homelands and now in say Saskatchewan, <laughs> let's be real. What do you think is the difference between being othered in your homelands? What is it like being here? When are you safe? When are you home? I, it's really, that's a really good question. I mean, I think I'm home with my husband. But at the same time, one of my friends once told me, well, your husband's European, you're Singaporean, and your kids are Canadian. It must be very interesting at home. And it is. I mean, my kids are so Canadian. They're at a football game tonight. And I don't, I'm like, I don't understand football. Someone's grandmother had to explain it to me when I was in the States, freezing my ass off. Um, but, you know, it's, when I was thinking about writing the poetry night, there's this poem that I wrote in particular for Maria Campbell. Because she, I was in, I was had the privilege, great privilege of being in the circle with her for a couple of months, where she was sharing books that she wanted to, um, us to read, and then we would have discussions every month. And she had all these stories about how um, Christianity and imposed religion really made such a damaging, had such a damaging effect on women's bodies. Um, you know, ways in which you conceive of the relationship with yourself, um, your community, your culture. And, you know, having been brought up extremely Roman Catholic, I saw that kind of the same othering, you know, um, going on, the same kind of like destruction of indigenous traditions, um, where, you know, my father would be told, oh, this Taoist religion, this Taoist ritual, or this Chinese festival, oh, that's like the work of the devil, so we don't go follow this, you know, we have to go to church. And I think that what is safe anymore? I mean, I don't know. I mean, we live in an incredibly fractured space. And one that, you know, like Dion Brand used to say, like everywhere you walk is harm. Everywhere is like a burial ground. Everywhere something bad happened. I mean, like Saskatchewan, right? I mean, like when Maria tells me stories about like what's going on, like just along this bend of the road, I'm like, oh my God, I drive by there all the time. Like I didn't know that happened. And um, that's really hard to find a safe space. And I think that what's really important is to build community to build those circles um, and to make, like, I don't think it's like where you find it, it's like, how do you make it? And everybody has a responsibility to try and hold that space for other people. That's what I think, that's what I try to do. I mean, I don't know whether it's totally successful in classes and stuff like that, or in my relationships, but I think we have to, it, it's on us, right? We can't just like, oh, here's a nice safe country I can be in. That's, I mean, like when I came to Canada, I was very, certain that I didn't just inherit like you know I have students who are refugees we didn't just inherit a safe haven we inherited all the terrible history that comes with it too and if you're not willing to acknowledge that then there's a problem <laughs> there's nothing to add to that you're brilliant you're a brilliant speaker um <laughs> this could just be me fangirling all week oh my like this is it um, there's this poem here, I marked it down. I'm sorry, I wrote all over your book. Um, that's like, that's like a real compliment. <laughs> <laughs> like I, and I bent the spine, I'm sorry. Um, 56, Circle for Maria. For yeah. Maria! Mm -hmm. um, where it talks about your ancestors, um, and there's this, there's this thing. Um, I'm going to read it, sorry. I know some small things, like how not to place chopsticks in a bowl of rice, how to lay a stick of incense, how to place my palms together at my heart, 
how to greet distant relatives. But so much else was cut away, taken, made dirty. You see me as clearly as my lack. I'll have to relearn everything now. Damn, girl. <laughs> Damn. I find that your work just cuts to the heart. You're not allowed a, a soft reading of this because you, you're very poetic and you bring the reader in and you set this scene and then you cut us. <laughs> I'm not okay. <laughs> but um, let's talk about matriarchy a bit more because I felt like what this was like you're raising boys, wonderful boys, lovely boys. Mm. Um, married to a lovely man who made us coffee the other night. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of matriarchy being raised by mom and grandparents and having lost them both now, this very, this turning time of life, we're 40 ish. Um, <laughs> How does this change of life and this awareness of both our lack of culture, but our want of culture, how is this affecting your writing, your, your raising of men, your partnership? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to raise boys. Like, I mean, I think it's the hardest thing I've ever done, maybe. Um, and it's hard in particular to thinking about, you know, their relationship to the women around them and to me. Um, but I do think that my boys have the privilege of not just, you know, like having known my mom and my grandma quite well, but also, of course, my in-laws, my, my mother-in-laws is wonderful, sort of Italian matriarch. Um, they had the privilege of knowing all their great grandmothers. And I liked, I hope to think, you know, um, that that not to imprint in their lives. But on the other hand, you know, like you said, we're getting to 40. We're thinking about what does it mean to be approaching matriarch status. I mean, I don't know when I can ever get there, right? I don't know when. Like, Somebody called me an auntie, and I was like, "What the hell?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I'm embracing my auntie them. Like I know. I mean, once you like, you know, you have two teenagers, they basically make you feel you're totally uncool all the time. So I'm an auntie, <laughs> um, but. That's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, like, I, I do think that things are changing and especially for the kids, um, you know, I, I see like, and then some things stay, stay the same. So it's really hard, you know, to bring up boys because you just don't want them to turn into assholes. <laughs> like, you want them to respect <laughs> the woman in their lives and you want them to be able to, you know, be comfortable with women who are strong. But that's actually harder than, with all the other socialization, that's, that's actually harder than it seems, right? Okay. I'm not criticizing Luca and Dante, they're great, but uh, I just think just generally that's hard. Yeah. And this poem on page six, I'm going to bring in specific examples now. That's because you guys look out of by the book now. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, like you build a scene and then you cut us, and this poem is about dreaming, but it's, you don't know it's a dream and you see your mother. And the last line is like, mom, it's me, I'm here, I'm here. I wait before she can answer. Cool. Did you get a chance to read any of these to your mom? My mother was famously like not particularly interested in my poetry, <laughs> which is okay. Neither is my husband really. He makes his poetry <laughs> face. That's all right. I find it's a very private thing. Um, I wrote a story about my mom once, like a nonfiction, and we were in Florence together taking a holiday, and like I'm up late at night writing a poem, and she never asked to see it. She's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like writing a poem. She's like, and she never asked to see it. But um, this past year, before she passed, I, I read her a couple of poems from this book, and then she was like. She, I was like, is, is that enough? You want to hear more? And she was like, no, no, I'm done. <laughs> uh, which is fine. I mean, you know, uh, but you know what? I'll, I'll read you guys this poem because, I mean, I find it really hard to read poems about my mom because it's so fresh. But I don't know. I think if any, any of you have ever lost someone close to you, I, I hope this speaks to you. This poem's called Lucid. I enter the old flat through its worn door, its single long corridor leading from front entrance to my bedroom. All is as it always was. I hear my father's voice, the sound of running water. On my left, stories below street traffic. On my right, beyond the windows, the jungle, 
the call of birds. My mother lies on her stomach in a pink floral nightdress. I think they placed her this way so she can breathe. I walk into my room that is no longer mine, move a pillow like a ghost. I change my mind, go back to my mother and say, mom, it's me, I'm here, I'm here. I wait before she can answer. It's such a beautiful honor. I lost my track of that. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I'm not okay. I'm not okay. <laughs> I have the cleanest, don't worry. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> no, I really enjoy this, like I said, because we're friends and like we're academic friends, we're social friends, but we're never poetry friends before. And there's just so much similarities because story time. Um, I've written about my mother, not in my not in my sex books. <laughs> but, <I'm glad. laughs> yeah. but in this new collection I've written about my mother and I wrote about this this um, Polaroid I found of her and it's this Polaroid it's like in the 70s she has short curly hair giant brown glasses she's wearing um, a halter top a white halter top with double cherry stems and like daisy dupes like, who is this woman? Nice. My mother was never that old. Yeah, she's like the 70s in Saskatchewan. And um, there's this hand wrapped around her waist, and she's leaning over, like, laughing, okay? But it's like this hairy white arm. It's not my dad. <laughs> it's just this hairy arm. And I was astounded when I found this. And I kept it with me for the longest time because there's that moment of seeing my mother as not my mother. You know, that transitional thought of, there was somebody there before I even existed. And it was such a beautiful moment. And I wrote a poem about it, about this Métis woman of the Tosh and her like lovers raining down like water. And you know, this beautiful poem of her strength and her sensuality and like her joy and laughter. And I read it to her and she's like, you made me sound like a whore. <laughs> I am here for mothers who don't get your poetry. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you, I appreciate that. Oh, but I love what you're saying about how there are people before, right? And I think that, um, but it's so, in some ways, it's really awkward to share that part of yourself with your kids. Another reason why I'm grateful that I'm not here. Um, don't watch the YouTube stream. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, but like, I, I mean, I hope I bring her alive in some other poetry that we'll write later, but right now it's just almost too much, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think poetry is one of those things where, we have to be as authentic and real as possible. And our mothers aren't perfect. But at times of mourning, like how can you write anything but perfection? So I feel that. Um, what are, 20 years in the making, what are you feeling? I'm so happy for you. What are you feeling? Um, why did it take so long? <laughs> Just because I had to pursue an academic career, I was a broadcast journalist, I had two kids, got married. Um, but uh, I, I'm just I'm just excited. I, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I, I'm surprised anybody wants to read it, really. Because for so long, I've held them so close to my chest. I haven't done a reading like this, like a long extended reading in 19 years. So I feel like I've been busy doing other things, other kinds of writing, putting my tenure file together, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I don't nothing. <laughs> but um, it's all, it was always there, and and the head, you know having the support of the press and my editor and my friends actually who be like, you need to publish this stuff, you need to put it together in the collection. That was very empowering, because I'm not formally trained. I don't have an MFA. Um, you know, I've written in sports now and then. I, I help this one about full-time jobs all the time. I had kids, like it was intense, um, but it never left me. And so, you know, there's, I guess there's almost still hope. I hope the next one doesn't take 20 years because <laughs> I'm not going to publish the next one in 62. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I just have like one or two more thoughts, thought processes, <laughs> and we're going to open up the floor for questions from the ground. I will judge you if you don't participate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm either an excellent host or an awful host. I'm not sure yet. That's a lie. It's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> she's 
Should we draw like? <laughs> I, I could. We could just talk poetry and feelings. Oh my god, I can't. I hate talking feelings, but uh, this is so good. Okay. Um, kinship, matriarchy, motherhood, partnership, land, othering. You didn't shy away from anything, um, which is really funny and beautiful and brave, especially in Saskatchewan. Welcome to Saskatchewan. Um, poetry is politics. Go. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> no um, I feel like. Um, this is what my students must feel like. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, it is. And I wrote this poem. Like one of the things that um, I was fearful of is who am I as an outsider to write about Saskatchewan? Um, and from what perspective to write about, you know, and to write to words and to people who've lived here for generations, for millennia. <laughs> um, and, you know, who am I as this newcomer who's only lived here for six years? to make all this political commentary. But then living here through, um, when I just arrived, um, it was the murder of Colton Bushi and you know, the trial of General Stanley. And, and that was really hard to escape. Like it, it, it really made, coming from Toronto, I didn't understand the depth of anti-Indigenous racism in this country until I moved here. And then during COVID, watching the kind of way the pandemic unfolded in the province, um, you know, those, those just horrible statistics every day, we were waiting for the numbers of people who were sick, who were dying. And, and that was really hard to do. And there's another poem in the collection about that as well, because, you know, I think um, the chief health medical officer, he said, from now on, every day is going to be a mass casualty event in Saskatchewan. And that, like, I mean, I stayed in Saskatoon was the longest I've ever stayed in one place all my life because of the pandemic, which sounds kind of nuts, but it's true. Like, you know, when I was a little baby, we went back from St. Bart, Malaysia. So Saskatoon is like the longest place, two and a half years that I've stayed in. Um, and then I felt in some ways I had to, I had to share my perspective with someone who's inside and outside at the same time. Um, and, in, and, and, I, and I started drawing these relationships between like extraction of, uh, of like, you know, resources both in Singapore and in Saskatchewan and like, like also the current provinces like Alberta and my own country that basically enriched itself refining petroleum. And we're all connected that way, we're all connected by colonialism, we're all connected that way. And so it became, I guess I started to understand that, you know, my ways of knowing were not limited by geography in some ways. Yeah. Beautiful. Is anybody ready? <laughs> the pressure. I'm gonna run around the mic, y'all. Uh, not to make this. Okay, there we go. Uh, <laughs> so the mic is just so that everyone can hear, and also so that the folks on the live stream can hear. Um, and if anyone on the live stream has questions, feel free to just type them in the box there. Thanks for this, Joanne. Um, uh, I'm wondering if this book was a way of writing yourself home, not only to Singapore, but making yourself at home in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. I, I don't. I have a very, I guess, fraught relationship with the word home, even or the conception of home. Um, I've always felt a little bit like it, like I didn't quite fit both in Singapore and I suspect in Canada as well. And I always see myself as a kind of like a wrench in the cogs, you know, una unable, perhaps unwilling to, to sort of go with the kind of superficial or very visible um, aspects of a space. So am I making a home? In some ways, maybe, but I'm also, I think, I want to unsettle that notion of, of, of settling, of, of being at home, and then just sort of trying to make people question, I guess, you know, some, some deeply held, I guess, beliefs and truths. This place we call home here, right, even here, what, what does that mean? Um, especially for, for settlers, even settlers of color, right? What does that mean? Um, and, and how do we sort of come to terms with the history of that, really? 
Right. My, I mean, my my ancestors came from China to what they call the South Seas to Nanyang. So Singapore is not home in that sense, and yet it is. Um, and then my children will grow up Canadian, but they'll be hyphenated. And what does that mean as well? And then what does that mean in terms of our relationships with in the indigenous communities in our space as well? Right. So so I think that the book was also about sort of unsettling that and thinking through. Um, you know, it, what does it mean to say someplace is home and what it, then are our responsibilities to the space? Uh, we've had a question come in on the live stream that I'm going to read out for you. Um, how did the various forms of the poems you crafted for this collection help you do the difficult work of stitching together such seemingly disparate, just uh, disparate geographies and experiences? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an excellent form question. Um, <laughs> Um, I know that's a really tough one. And that came from Sheila. Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> Always asking the hard questions. Um, one of the things that really inspired me was the Canadian title manual that I picked up in, yeah, I know it's a really, really interesting um, publication that I picked up in a secondhand bookstore in Vancouver. And if you look at the epigraph for the section four shores, the Canadian title manual, which is a very extremely scientific manual that I don't claim to understand at all, but it's actually really poetic. And it says, since the observed tide consists not of a single wave, but of the superposition of many tide waves of different frequency and amplitude. I lose your name. It will never fit exactly any of our simple descriptions. So basically the quote is saying, like the waves and the tides are so different every single time that they will never fit exactly any of our simple descriptions. So I was thinking, there is no way to really comprehend these waves of immigration, these waves of colonialism, these waves of decolonization. There's nothing that will ever fit our simple descriptions. And maybe this is where poetry comes in. And for example, in like the, the section that's all made from legal jargon, maybe if you take it and break it, you can start to understand in the cracks of the legal language how power functions. Um, and I think I try to do that in the rest of my poetry as well. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like telling the truth, but telling a slant. Um, and, and, and so that's how I hope form operates, that it suggests things, it suggests the kind of underlying structure and power of things, even when I can't say it directly. If that makes sense. Sorry, Sheila. <laughs> Any other questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just cackling away. <laughs> oh, I want to ask the question that you're always going to get asked. What's your favorite poem? Oh my god. <laughs> It'll change. It's fine. Today, what's your favorite poem? Uh, today, my favorite poem is one that I did not read, but if everybody buys the book, uh, it is. <laughs> We're going to read it. Maybe. It's on yeah. page 89. Those of you who have the book. <laughs> oh, oh, I think it's a bit beautiful way to end your reading. You think so? I think so. Okay, last call. Does anyone have any more questions? There's one left on the live stream. Oh, yeah, I'd like to take it. Yeah. Oh. Okay, we'll do the live stream. Is it okay? Sure. Uh, and then there's question? one more. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, from the live stream, Jamie says, Hi, Joanne. How does your poetic practice connect to your academic research? Would love to know how you switch between more critical argumentative modes to creative modes of writing. Cool, cool question. Thanks, Jamie. Um, a lot of the travel that I did back to Singapore, uh, to Hong Kong, to Vancouver, um, and like a lot of the research, I guess, that I did for this book um, was funded by academic funding and was part of uh, my academic work. So for those who don't know, my academic work obviously deals with like post-colonial writing, um, art, film, culture, um, but also, you know, thinking about ecology and like ecological devastation um, in the wake of colonialism. Sorry, super like nerdy stuff. Um, but I always found in my critical work, um, there was something I couldn't get at. There was something that was very intimate to myself, the way I strongly felt about something that I couldn't really put into my academic work. 
Um, and so how do I switch between the two? I mean, I, for some reason, it comes very naturally to me. Whatever I can't put in my academic writing uh, it's just kind of subsumes itself into poetry or creative nonfiction. I've been experimenting with more, I guess, autobiographical ways of positioning myself in the research that I'm doing and just thinking about how we're all complicit really my father my grandfather on my mom's side was an, a mechanic for shell you know um, if you take short funding you're getting funding from the extraction there's no escaping it and being aware of that i think um, is part of that kind of creative critical uh, purpose yeah and that was was it jake no it was jake oh, <laughs> Hey, Joanna. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Regence is my ex student. She's brilliant. Oh, thank you. I think you're brilliant. Um, yeah, you, you taught me a lot um, during my undergrad. And just like seeing you do what you do and being like a woman of color also in the English department, in like a colonial department, I think is super awesome. So you know, oh, you know this though. You inspired me a lot. Um, but I was wondering, were there any poems or like collections that you were nervous about publishing? Um, I guess just like being in the position that you're in, being like a woman of color in academia, um, and just like having that background that, you know, branching out into poetry, you still have, you know, that kind of tag attached that, you know, you are a person that has a lot of power in a sense and a lot of influence. Um, so I'm just curious if there was anything that you were like nervous about putting out. I think definitely the stuff critiquing Singapore politics and like developing there, I'm still very nervous about it. Um, for those of you who don't know, I spent about seven years being a journalist in Singapore. And if you know anything about the politics of Singapore, I, I tried to give you guys a shorthand. It's very authoritarian. There's a lot of censorship um, in the arts and in the media. So in some ways, the media in Singapore felt like um, just an arm of the government. So if you kind of know what that's like, you know, that's how a free press in Canada can like criticize the government. That that doesn't happen in Singapore. And so because I've been conditioned that way, all those poems I wrote about the laws, all those poems I wrote about development in Singapore, all those poems where I'm trying to really, really sort of think about the, the violence of like, I mean, there were detentions without trial, there was torture, there were there's like, you know, um, people who've been exiled. Uh, every time I write about that, I have this fear. You know, I saw a family there and uh, it seems really strange to me that I'm all the way in Saskatchewan. But sometimes this fear comes back to the point where we're like afraid of signing petitions, afraid of participating in particular panels. Um, and I'm trying to work through it. I, I, you know, I hope this book is some small way of working through it too. But no, well, thanks. That was a great question. Thanks for being sensitive to that. That's really, that's really great. Thank you. <laughs> she turned it off. <coughs> Good question. Um, do you want me to read the poem? I do want to read the poem. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions before <laughs> I read this poem? But apparently, it's my favorite poem. Oh, I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much to both of you and everyone here. I kind of wanted to get back to something you started with, Tineo, about the idea of the poetry as political, um, thinking about, of course, the remarkable Jean Jordan and how that had been situated in her own writing, and uh, then coming up with the title commentaries around frequencies and amplitude, and thinking how much those are intertwined, and how in the politics of poetry, one of the reasons why it is so intensely political is because it's a revealing of the truth of an individual but it also has to do with vocality. So when I'm thinking about these frequencies and amplitudes of the tides, I'm thinking about this sort of increase of, of the assumption of space and the audibility of this voice that you're putting forward and how incredibly um, political that is. And then when hearing this person describe, you know, as a woman of color in a very colonial environment um, and like, who says post? Like, what? You're, you're in the colonial now, um, addressing what we are addressing, including some of the very specifics of your lived experience. That idea of drawing on the waters to describe a sense of amplitude and frequency, I think, is so much about your own voice 
And so this is perhaps more common than a question, but I think that between Danielle, yes, I'm that person. I apologize. <laughs> um, I apologize. <laughs> but it's because of what Danielle brought forward and which can be dropped easily. Like people miss, like people misunderstand what that political role is. It's not always overt. It, it can actually be acknowledgement of your presence and staging that space, which clearly has served many. So it's more a thank you to both of you for being those people. And um, that's all. And now I want to hear the poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is almost eight, so I will read this poem. Um, but thank you so much for being such an attentive and you know caring audience. It's like, you know, for 19 years not doing a reading is an extremely supportive experience. So, okay, so this poem on page 89, which is called Old Lover, um, you know, kind of conflates being in Singapore with a bunch of ex-lovers, sorry, husband. <laughs> <laughs> Old lover. My skin anticipates your humid breath as I step out of the airport. Have you been smoking again, drinking again? You were always too soused in your own success, all those button-down shirts hiding your capacity for amnesiac vendors. You're fatal, I know. A terminal case, although unceasingly ravenous. Take me to all our old haunts, those sticky bars, late nights in sodium lit parks, long rides along the disappearing coastline, untidy out of the way beaming houses. Nobody else will be there. So much of my body still belongs to you. The cells nourished by all those meals you fed me, all slick with animal fat, fermented spirits, spoonful after spoonful of rice, white softened with broth made from boiling bones for hours. You turn these morsels, these words against me. What I want you to be will never exist. Oh lover, you can't change. It's been too long. We have the same conversations, repeat the same names, laugh at the same punchlines. Your insular acts of deepening with each year. I just want to say thank you for the gift of this book. It is so needed. And although you talk about such different landscapes and places and ways of walking through this world, in the end, you're connecting us through water, through experience, through love, through loss. And there's nothing but a gift. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> no, Dory joke is it. I missed the first bit, so uh, but I yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, congratulations to uh, Joanne Liao. Uh, our thanks again to Transstone Press for working with us on tonight's event, uh, and of course to our host Neil K. Campbell, who will be at Word on the Street tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <So we'll> <laughs> Oh, Go check out that board on the street. Uh, did that just cut out? Oh, we're good. Uh, yeah, so Joanne's going to stick around and uh, sign books. You're more than welcome to get a copy signed before you purchase it. Uh, just make sure you stop at the till on the way out the door. Don't steal the books. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, people make honest mistakes and it just happens anyways. Um, yeah, so let's give them both another round of applause. Why don't you have another social engagement?